Catholic the U.S. have not uncovered any other case of a U.S. Catholic university rescinding an invitation to a theologian invited to give an academic address. I should note at this point that the Association of University Pressers, Professors Phi Beta Kappa, and uh, possibly WASC, the accrediting agency for this university, have uh, begun to express their deep concern about the president's actions, as have a number of alumni and outside commentators. Now, however, since we're talking about academic freedom, it probably would not be a bad idea to look at the university's own policies regarding academic freedom. They can be found in the Policies and Procedures Manual of the University, and I invite you to look at it yourselves if you can. I had to use my faculty ID to access that web page. If that page turns out not to be accessible to students, I don't know if it is or not, let me know and I'll get that page circulated by email. You should know, since those policies explicitly extend academic freedom to students as well as faculty. I quote, as always, in part, because full academic freedom in teaching, learning, scholarly activity, and academic decision making is a sine qua non of a university, the value of academic freedom is self-evident. Hence, the burden of proof lies with those who would seek to limit it. For any question ar uh, arising concerning the limits of academic freedom, all presumptions shall favor academic freedom. Whoever seeks to limit academic freedom has the burden to provide compelling reasons or evidence justifying the proposed limitations. The university maintains that academic freedom is compatible with the university's Roman Catholic identity. Thus, the university imposes no religious limitation on academic freedom. The university recognizes the inextricable link between academic freedom and shared governance. When exercising its authority under those policies, the university should give primary weight to the judgment of the faculty. Let me repeat that. Primary weight to the judgment of the faculty. That means the faculty, not the president. And finally, in their academic coursework, students are entitled to full freedom of learning. The whole world of knowledge and ideas must be open to our students. There must be no banned books or subjects. The university advocates and protects its students' freedom of inquiry. Given the sum total of these statements, documents, and emails, I'm convinced, first of all, that this controversy is genuine and of deep relevance to education, not just Catholic education, and of compelling importance for us all since we're here while this is happening. I am convinced, that is, that President Mary Lyons has, in fact, violated academic freedom at the University of San Diego. And since I'm already committed, since I've already signed a letter to this effect, since I'm retiring, since I have nothing to lose, and therefore, <clears throat> and therefore because saying this publicly is easier for me at this moment than it would be for almost anyone else, I call this evening for her immediate resignation. Now, believe it or not, I'm not here tonight to ask that you should do that too. For one thing, you're not retiring. <laughs> this is one talk, one evening, one person, and that one person is on his way out. I imagine there'll be other persons, other talks, and other evenings. What I am here to argue for, to ask for really, is that you do what you already do. Listen, learn, inform yourself, check for yourself the accuracy of what I've been saying and then decide where you stand. And that above all is what I'm here for, decide, have a stand. Because what is at stake is not just academic freedom. This is about the soul of a university, of what has been and what it will be, of what it means for you and for all of us and for those who were once here and for those who might yet be here now and in the future. Now, taking a stand is actually fairly easy. It's what you do with your stand that gets complicated. You might, however, or you might, for example, just disagree with me. Okay. In that case, it's a debate, and a good one, because in the long run, it can't help but be good for the university. Bring it on. On the other hand, you might agree with me, but not be able to do anything about it. For a thousand completely legitimate reasons, you're graduating in January, let's say, you're $100,000 in debt, and you have a few bad habits, like eating actual food and sleeping with a roof over your head. <laughs> In that situation, uh, you need a job. In that situation and, many, and in many others, we understand. We can't, nor would we ever wish to, command your life. If something that or something like that is your situation, by all means, live, the way, live your life the way you need to um, and Godspeed. But there is a third possibility, which is that you agree with me. Then the question is, now what? What do we do about that? The first thing I would suggest 
is that you understand that doing nothing is itself taking a position. It means whether you say it this way to yourself or not, that other things are more important to you than this academic freedom issue. It means that not voting is actually a vote, a vote for the status quo, a vote for, uh, in favor of the way things are. That the problem, well, maybe it's a problem, it's not that big of a problem, it matters, okay, but I don't want to, I don't know how to, how to deal with it. In that case, a dictum from the long ago, from my own personal long ago, from the 1960s in this country, in protests against the war in Vietnam, if you're not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Your inertia stands in the path of the change that is coming to this university, no matter what that change turns out to be. So I hope you will not do that. Come to the table. Inform yourself to the best of your ability. Take nothing for granted, including what I say this evening. Be part of the discussion and act according to your heart and conscience. I'm only one person. I speak for no one tonight but myself but I call this evening for the formation of joint student faculty working groups to gather information, plan and co coordinate our actions with or without input from the administration. And I would prefer without since the administration is itself the target of any investigation we might like to undertake. And if the administration is involved, then there's the problem of conflict of interest, of self-dealing. I think the faculty and the students should consider working together first and we'll see what happens later because we are the lost voices of this university. Faculty and students are the reason there even is a University of San Diego. Let's stand together and bring light, air, commitment, and, and dare I say it, even pride to this university and become individually and collectively the change makers we say we are. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Now, I am told that we have about 15 minutes for questions, after which they're gonna give me some kind of award. So we don't wanna delay that too much. I'm gonna to move to these chairs, one of these chairs down here and be a little more comfortable. And if you, have, if you don't have any questions, that's cool. I'll get my, reward, my award sooner. Uh, but if you do, I'll be happy to take them for about 15 minutes. Can you hear me? Okay, this thing works. Oh, whoa. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh, Gail, I didn't see you, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes, um, we do. That's and right. the students have a committee. I, I, I'm not sure if they call their committee. They already have one. Okay. So committees exist. So it's just one more typical move by the administration <clears throat> to avoid democracy, to avoid legitimate representation. <clears throat> and I was just so disheartened that, that faculty would want to be on the yet another dummy committee, more flip chart democracy. Oh, good. We'll write that down and then burn the chart. You know. So I, I'm wondering, maybe we I should. I thought maybe I was being too radical, Gail. Yeah, but just okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Possibly existing committees, which are the academic assembly, and the student organization, yeah. created the protest. Uh, well, first of all, let me point out the academic assembly is just the College of Arts and Sciences. So I think we want to try to broaden that as much as we can. However, the general tenor of what you're saying, I agree with. I was trying to indicate that at the end. I would just be skeptical of uh, a committee put together to examine possible violations of academic freedom when that committee is put together by the people who might have violated academic freedom. I mean, that, uh, and that's why I'm, I'm thinking that I'm not sure what the mechanism would be. It's gonna depend ultimately on how much people care, how much they, they wanna work on, on these kinds of issues, how important all of, all of you and, and more beyond this room how important you understand that to be, not just to your education, but to the kind of use, university you're part of and will be part of uh, after you graduate. Um, and that, um, I don't, that's, to me, that's, you know, I spent 30 years of my life here. I wanna 
you know, I want to be proud, too, of, of, of the University of San Diego. For the most part, I am. I have been until this issue came up. And this issue is a powerful one. And um, I think we should do what we can uh, to be civil, I suppose. But um, I'm not sure I know what that means, actually. Um, if it means polite, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable. Um, but to um, let's, the, the students and faculty have not worked together enough as it is anyway. And I have uh, observed that the protests, the questions come from places like the Vista, from students meeting in various places, the hard questions, the questions about why is this happening, what, about, what does this mean? The students and the faculty, I don't think I have observed any administrator joining us. Where, was, where, was, where were the administrators when this, this uh, uh, question involving Tina Beattie first came up? Even if they thought it was okay, they weren't saying that. There's this curiously muted response from the administration. That makes me uncomfortable. And I just hope that students and faculty to find, can get together and find a way to address these issues in a way that helps us be sure that nothing's getting swept under the rug. Bart, if you were 30 years younger, and this is, or, this is back in, or, or this was back in the 1960s, um, can you relate your experiences then and, and how they might relate to what's happening now and what you would do? Well, I'll tell you something. Um, I graduated from Stanford in 1970, which means I was there in the late 60s for protests against the war in Vietnam. However, the, I took part in two uh, sit-ins and demonstrations. The first involved something called the Applied Electronics Laboratory. And uh, we sat in it overnight until finally the administration would talk to us about it. But we realized at the time that although the context was the war in Vietnam, that particular uh, action had nothing to do with Vietnam. It had to do with violations of academic freedom, the same kind of questions that we're involved in here. Because what was happening at the Applied Electronics Laboratory was the, that there were university faculty doing classified research, which means that the university was voluntarily giving up some part of its own academic freedom for money, in that case for Defense Department contracts. And our position was that a university, above all, is a place where free and open discussions need to happen, and there should not be, ever be any uh, classified research done in any university, not just Stanford. And to this day, Stanford has a policy that there will be no classified research done at Stanford. A couple of years after that, Stanford owned a place called the Stanford Research Institute. The same issue, the same matter. They were doing classified research for the Defense Department. For that, when we were in the streets, we got chased by the police although I never got arrested. <laughs> I could run faster in those days than I can now. Um, and Stanford's response to that was to spin off the Stanford Research Institute into a separate company now called SRI, which still exists. Um, and the principle, though, was the same, that the university will not do classified research because the whole idea of classified research is a violation of academic freedom. So as T.S. Eliot says somewhere, I think in the four quartets, in my end is my beginning, I do have a sense of going full circle here. As I entered universities, I'm involved in issues involving uh, academic freedom, and as I leave, here I am again. And I'll tell you something, you guys, look just like we did in 1969. You're still America's best and brightest. Yes, yes ma'am, way in the back. Um, I was just wondering, I've heard some rumors that uh, part of the decision involved donors threatening to uh, not donate anymore, and um, I was wondering if uh, you think that that is a big factor, and if so, how we can overcome that as a private university. Yeah, I, first of all, I have no knowledge on my own of whether that's true or not. Uh, however, the president herself and her defense of her um, uh, actions mentions that the, those people who uh, gave money to create the CCTC had not given it for the purposes that the CCTC was using it. So to the extent that the president says so herself, I think we can say that that may have been a factor. How much of a factor, I have no idea. And I agree that a private university needs to be, any university needs to be sensitive to where its money comes from. But I think I actually think, in this case, the president's initial decision to set up the CCTC, to raise money to, to find it, was 
was the precipitating event for what we're dealing with now. Because it, as it turns out, uh, it looks as though the, the donors uh, have certain Catholic views that are a fairly narrow range of Catholic views, and that the CCTC must adhere to those, that narrow range, or else uh, we'll take our football and go home. And um, that's a problem. The, and in my opinion, the CCTC should never have been set up if there were conditions attached, even unspoken conditions, to uh, what it could do and what it could not do. That's a little different than what you were asking. I mean, I think all universities, especially university presidents, are engaged 24 hours a day in trying to find money for, for their university. I don't blame the, the president for that. I question the wisdom of the way she did it in the case of the CCTC. Hi, just, and just a quick one. Um, regarding, so, so I think the major issue that's been brought up here is, is academic freedom. Yeah. And I think that um, this also has to do a little bit, and I'm, I'm sure they're interrelated, but how much is this also an issue of um, um, e equality of people with different uh, sexual orientations? This is also an issue of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think it's an issue about people with different uh, sexual orientations because the president and presumably this group of Catholics with a fairly narrow range of, of opinion uh, made it an issue that it was Tina Beattie's support of same-sex marriage that precipitated her being rescinded well after the fact. So yeah, I think that that's an issue. Now how much of an issue it was, I'm not sure I'm the person to ask because it's not an issue for me. I mean, it was an issue for the president and for those donors that she was being sensitive about, uh, the CCTC. Clearly it's an issue for somebody. And um, I don't know, I don't actually know uh, that this university has a position on um, um, same-sex marriage? I mean, I have no idea. Um, my understanding is that we welcome people, officially we welcome people of all sexual orientations. But this kind of an action makes you wonder. Okay, so uh, I know you are encouraging students to like kind of get involved and try to figure out what we need to do, but I know a lot of students want to do something but don't really know how, yeah. and that's the most difficult part, and like trying to connect with faculty, and so what do you suggest that we can all do? Because I know a lot of us, yeah. like we care about